The Lord be with you. This is the day which the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Welcome to each of you in the name of Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord and Savior. A special word of welcome to guests and visitors who are with us today. You know who you are. I don't. Uh, so uh, if you see someone who looks like a guest or a visitor, be sure to extend to them a welcome. If you are looking for a church home, we'd invite you to make town and country Lutheran Church to be your home. I'm uh, Pastor Philip Tesh. I am uh, the pastor part-time at Cordova Lutheran Church uh, in Rancho Cordova. It's my uh, privilege to have brought the organist uh, today. Uh, so... so um, <clears throat> I checked with her, the, the only other time she has been on this organ is when she was the organist uh, for the Reformation service uh, uh, a year or so ago. We open our worship this morning as we sing our hymn, Christ Whose Glory Fills the Skies.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, you ble your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world. Grant that Christ, the bread of life, may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson comes from the book of Ephesians chapter four, starting at verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away, all, uh, put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the verse. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. 
Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give you for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for our hymn number 636. We sing the verses indicated, verses 1, 4, 6, and 8.
Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, our Heavenly Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the reading from Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, which you heard read just a few minutes ago. Special focus on the very last verse. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Amen. It's still every kid's time of year. It's still summer when you can sleep late, hang out with your friends, do as you please at least for the most part. Freedom. From all the rules of school and schedules that everybody else makes for you. Of course, I always think this is the best time of year to be an adult, too. Largely because it's such a great time for children. It's interesting to watch children interact with each other. Sometimes they cooperate with one another so well, sometimes not so well, because they're sinful like everybody else. What makes children get along with one another? We certainly would like to find out the formula for that. As with most things, when it comes to raising children to cooperate in wholesome ways, there are two extreme views. There's the permissive approach, and there's the strict authoritarian approach. Wise parents are always looking for something in between those two. Our Heavenly Father is the wisest parent of all. And in our text this morning, our loving Father, through Paul, teaches his children how to get along. How they get along as they are growing up. He knows the best of all teaching methodologies, and that means neither of those extremes, but the strengths of both approaches. Human parents can draw some pretty good advice from this word of God, and yet God is not really speaking to us as if we were parents. He's speaking to all of us as children. His children, who are forever children. That's fundamental for everything God says to us in this text today. Our Father teaches us as his children. And St. Paul assures us, you were sealed for the day of redemption as beloved children. We are children of God, all of us, at every age. We are sealed as his children. And God did that. He sealed us as, he, as our children in our baptisms. Baptism is the visible act by which God puts his seal on us. It marks each one of us on the forehead, on the heart, as his child. But that act, God also responsibly is raising us by that act as making us his children. He reserves now that he's got to be teaching us things that a parent would teach a child like how to get along with one another. And throughout the last three chapters of the letter to the Ephesians, his emphasis is teaching us how to live with our fellow Christians and all of the rest of God's children, all of whom are part of this family. And just like kids, sometimes we get along well and sometimes not so well. We, as children, have our squabbles on the ball field. We fight over who gets which seat in the car for the longest part of the trip. We may 
propelled together with water balloons, except that the older we get, the more our squabbles are different. We destroy someone's reputation through gossip, gossip rather than shouting over the who gets to bat first. We might fight for a position that the other person wants just as much as we do rather than sitting, uh, fighting for a seat that has the best view. We soak each other with verbal abuse rather than mere water that on a hot summer day can actually feel pretty good. That kind of behavior is no more acceptable among adult Christians than it is for kids on summer vacation. God intends in our text to lead us to a better kind of interaction with each other. Every parent's dream is to have children who are kind and forgiving of one another rather than being bitter or angry. How can parents make that happen? How does God make that happen? Well, our Father has his do's and don'ts for getting along. And remember that extreme permissive approach? The parent gives full responsibility for development to the child. The parent lets the child learn on his own how to get along. Every day is sort of like a summer free for all. The idea is that independence lets the child develop his or her creativity to the fullest. Unfortunately, children in such totally permissive homes often develop a very egocentric me first. That kind of view that leads way beyond water balloons Children in such environments often develop resentment for parents who don't seem to care enough to provide guidance. It's always tempting to think, well, if only my parents didn't tell me so many things that I should or should not do. Social scientists tell us that children need to know that. Children actually want to know how their parents feel about doing something or not doing something. God certainly does not take this kind of anything-goes attitude with his children. And it's because he cares about them. In fact, when his children sin, Paul tells us that he even grieves. He mourns. The Holy Spirit is described as being like a parent. He's the one who teaches us what's God, what God's will is. He opens the scriptures to us and tells us what God wants us to know. And he grieves when we ignore it. The Holy Spirit is the one who shows us what God's love is like. And he grieves when our lives don't reflect that love. Imagine the grief that a parent feels when a son or daughter hurts someone else's child. Maybe it's through a violent crime, but even if it's only accidental. Or when a child rejects everything that a parent has done for her or him, storms out of the house at age 18, vowing never to come back. Or when a parent sees a child go the wrong way in life, perhaps destroying himself or herself with an addiction to drugs or alcohol or unchristian relationships. It's so hard to go back after you've been in any of those situations. So the Holy Spirit is grieved when God's children hurt one another. When we reject everything that God has done in creating us and redeeming us and caring for us. 
whenever we hurt ourselves, we are generally falling into sin, and we certainly are causing the spirit to grieve. God cares about us too much to just sit back and see whether we are going to learn to get along by ourselves. And he doesn't like this, oh, well, boys will be boys or children will be children attitude when Christians hurt each other. No, he makes some clear commands. He has these definite do's and don'ts for how we get along with each other. It is completely inconsistent with a Christian faith when believers fight, carry grudges, or talk evil about other believers. Of course, it's sinful to do those things to uh, other people as well, but we're in a family. We've got special family rules that says you treat your family differently. Christian families must not raise voices in anger against other members of the family. God does not permit it. God <clears throat> commands his children to be kind and compassionate and forgiving. And we are to care about the hurt that others are feeling at the death of a loved one or any other serious event that takes place in their lives. We are literally commanded to support each other. Others who are feeling weak when life seems to be going wrong. Or as we find out in these days, we just don't know what's expected of us. We want to do the right thing, but I keep listening to the news day after day, and it just sort of seems as if they change the rules all of the time. That recalls the Old Testament sacrifices. When here, uh, Paul writes about how showering us with huge doses of love and he calls us kids, his dearly beloved, and he proved that that's exactly what we are to him when Christ sacrificed himself for us. It's certainly the biggest demonstration of love that you can have, giving up your life as a sacrifice Jesus died on the cross because God loves us. God wanted us to be his, to be his friends even before we were born. Friends who could serve him. Friends who could serve everybody else in the family willingly. Well, that could only be possible if he dealt with the sin that separated us from him. And that's what Jesus died, did by dying and rising again. So Paul uses that terrific phrase that Jesus gave himself as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In the Old Testament, the smoke of the burnt offerings was released up to God and nobody walked around with their fingers on their noses trying to prevent them. They, they wanted to smell it. The offerings, the, sa the burnt offerings were a pleasant and desirable smell. Well, nothing that the Old Testament people or we ourselves could present to God could please him like that. We don't do those sacrifices anymore. So Jesus did it for us. He was God demonstrating his love for us. Christ's pleasing God for us is why we could be sealed for the day of redemption. Once Christ had paid for the sins of the world, now the Holy Spirit comes to us in baptism through the word and gives us the forgiveness that Jesus Christ has earned. The seal means we can be certain of eternal life when our last day comes. And the seal that we receive in baptism is really a mysterious thing. 
When we think about a seal, we, we usually think about either an impression that we put in a piece of paper or a certificate, or a seal might be ribbon and wax that closes uh, something, uh, something up. A seal is usually something that we can see or even touch, but the seal that we receive in holy baptism is there, but we never see it. You can't tell the difference on a child's head uh, uh, or uh, well, uh, after the baptism takes place. Maybe unless they were really dirty in the first place and, 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 and the baptism was also a physical washing. But I mean, when, a month later or uh, two years later or 20 years later, you can't say, see my baptism? See, see where I had the water? It, it's not there to touch, to view. It's just there within us. It's a really remarkable and mysterious seal. The love that teaches us to love, that's what God's love. It starts with him, and so we say, let's imitate God. Let's do what God is ready to do. The Greek word for imitator gives us the word mimic. And you know what it means to mimic. It basically says, do what they're doing. You know, do, ex do it the same thing. How close can you get to mimicking what that person is doing? That's the way children learn. Children mimic their parents. Children who live in a loving home, they see how it's done and they mimic it. Dads start saying sweet things to mom. Spouses helping each other around the house. It rubs off on the kids. Don't kid yourself. Kids notice those things. And they will mimic the behavior later in their lives. God uses that technique on us. He teaches us by example how to get along with each other. He wants us to love. So let's mimic God because he loved us first. He wants us to forgive so he shows us forgiveness first by watching what happens on the cross of Christ. Even more important, God's love and forgiveness motivate us to love and forgive others and just get along. A child who lives in a house filled with tension and constant battles not only don't know how to live, they don't mimic anything else. They just sense the tension and the uneasiness and, and the unhappiness. That's what they learn. The anger that the children received, it is anger that is going to come out someplace, sometime. But a child who grows up in a loving family wants to be nice to other kids, wants to love other people. We Christians are all growing up in the most loving family that we could have hoped for. God's family. God's people. And in spite of all our sins, we are loved. In spite of our unworthiness, we're blessed every day. In spite of our bitterness and wrath, our anger, our clamor, our slander, our malice, all who believe have eternal life through Jesus Christ. God says so. That kind of love motivates us to get along. That kind of love motivates us to be growing up in a grace-filled and loving family. We are forever children in the family of God. Amen. And may the peace of God that continues when our human understanding does not, may that peace keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand and join me in confessing our historic Christian faith. We use the words of the Nicene Creed found on the inside the back cover of your hymnal. Together we confess, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and descended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We thank you, Lord, for our daily bread, for, we, we all, for all we need in this body and life. Grant us hearts so moved to give us, give as you have first given to us for the needs of others and in support of the work of your kingdom. Through your means of grace, keep us always fed with the grace and mercy of your Son, the living bread from heaven, Lord in your mercy. As your servant Elijah fled out of fear and was fed and nourished by you, come to us in our times of fear and anxiety that we may be fed with what lasts and sustains in our times of need. Be especially with those we name before you now in our hearts. Grant peace and healing, hope and health according to your will, Lord, in your mercy. As Jesus continued to teach the people of his day to know and see him as he is, grant that we continually learn of your love through him as our Savior. Guide children, parents, families, and individuals to rejoice in your word here and in homes that all be fed with your life-giving grace through the work of your Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. As we gather together in the fellowship of the sacrament you have set before us, grant that we faithfully receive and partake in the living bread that has come down from heaven with the assurance of sins forgiven, faith nourished, and your presence affirmed. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Good morning. I just wanted to update you on the call committee process. Good news, our committee is about finished with uh, interviews. We'll finish tomorrow. We've had some new candidates we're interviewing. On the 22nd, two weeks from today, we're gonna have a voters meeting to call a pastor in the Friendship Center. Uh, the time is to be determined. We're hoping it will be right after church at 1045, but that is dependent on if um, Pastor Bob can do it. The, the rules say the circuit visitor is supposed to do it, but Pastor Summer can't be here till 1245, so we're trying to get approval for Pastor Bob to do it at 1045, which we think will happen. Um, lastly, next Sunday, we will pass out summaries, like we did last time, of the pastors, so you can read about them in advance. And um, we're not gonna email that out because it's got some sensitive information. So that'll just be hard copies. So um, mark your calendars, uh, the 22nd, be here to vote to call the next pastor. Thank you.